Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Julie Williams, and I'm the vice president here at the South Shore Chamber. Also, the, the team liaison here for our NPO group, um, which is our nonprofit group, a peer professional group um, for this industry, very important industry sector of, um, of nonprofits. So as, as you'll see on the right-hand side, speaking of South Shore, I, I like to use this map from time to time because it is it shows people where maybe many on this um, meeting don't even reckon or realize just our catchment area. It's about 25 communities, um, really just south of Boston, all the way down to Plymouth on either side of kind of route three, if you think of it as a visual that way. Um, so I just wanted to make a note of that. Um, couple housekeeping tips. Uh, as you know, this is being recorded. We will um, share this recording to you all via an email early next week. And um, I think we'll also add it to the chamber blog. So it's also um, visible that way. We um, plan to end around 1030. Um, but just prior to that, maybe a little bit over, do a little networking after we close the meeting. And, um, you know, I know folks like to do that open networking. So we're going to try to afford as much time as we can, but we definitely have an agenda to get through. Um, we're not gonna go through introductions one by one since it's a fairly large group of us right now. So if you would like in the chat, please put in your um, name and organization and we'll be able to share that information, you know, in your email, we'll be able to share that with the group in the follow-up email. Um, and also, if you are not part of our Facebook group, that's a, um, a real-time tool for everyone to, to use and collaborate, um, you know, announce upcoming events, fundraisers, et cetera, throw out questions. Um, that is, I'll put that in the email that will go out to everyone, but also just be aware of what that is when you see it. It is a closed private group just for South Shore Chamber members who are nonprofits. So it's, a, it's very much um, a private group for you all to share with one another. There are not other members in that, in that group. So I'll make sure that is in the email to you. And at this time, I'm going to turn, I'm gonna stop this and I'm gonna turn it over to Lori Moranian, who is our, who's been our chair and our leader for the past two years, which was supposed to be a one year term um, through 2020 and 21, staying on board to, to carry us through uh, COVID and all these uncertainties. So I'm gonna turn it over to Lori, who is, the Director of Development of Cardinal Cushing Centers on her day job. So <laughs> take it away, Lori. Thank you, Julie. Um, good morning, everyone. It's really wonderful to be together with all of you again um, for another time. Um, I will think back to January 2020 when I started um, my position as co-chair and the the outgoing chair at the time, Martine Taylor, um, who was at Habitat for Humanity, she said to me, you know, what do you want your, you know, your vision for your chairship to be? Like, what do you think you want to accomplish over the 12 months? And little did we know at that time that it would really be about trying to keep us all connected and engaged um, in a much more virtual world and figure out how to kind of support each other, educate each other, and continue to elevate our position um, across the South Shore in the business community, all in the midst of a pandemic. So, it's been interesting, it's been fun, it's been um, really nice to connect with all of you. I mean, it would be nice in any circumstances, but the fact that um, I had this sort of group to lean on over these past two years especially has been really wonderful. So thank you for everything. Thank you for all your participation and your support. And I hope that you continue to attend all these events and continue to support this group. I know I'm not going anywhere. You will see me around, that is for sure. Um, but the reason why I say that is because I also have the pleasure this morning of introducing you to the slate for the steering committee of the MPO group for the 2022 year. And we're going to actually take a vote on that this morning. So Julie's bringing that up. 
um, you will see that we have Christine Buckley as chair from the Brain Aneurysm Foundation, Erin Cohen, vice chair, Road to Responsibility, Barb Wallstrom back again as clerk from Friends of the South Shore. And I would just want to say um, to everyone that has served with me over the past two years, thank you so much. And my partner, Julie, I couldn't have done it without you. Um, and then you see the rest of the steering team members in front of you there, Serenity Bellow, Marianne Blackmer, Rick Doan, Brenda Linden, Cara Flynn Thompson, Kristen White, Samantha Woods, and Julie Williams. Really wonderful group of people to continue this um, effort that we all have going here. So I'll just give a moment, but um, is there a motion to approve the slate? Maybe if someone could unmute. I move that we approve the slate. Thank you, Rick. As and presented. Is there a second? I second the motion. Thank you, Marianne. Um, so if you all want to come off on mute for one sec, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Good. And is, are any opposed? Right, so the eyes have it. And um, many, many welcomes to your new steering committee chair members for 2022. Yeah. And I think with that, I can actually turn it over to you, Christine. Wow, thanks, Lori, and everybody for, for this opportunity. Um, I have to say, I'm super excited. I would say prior to this, I've been a pretty, I'd say, laps not the best member but always try to be as, as involved in a, as I could be so this opportunity is you know raising my level of commitment and I don't think I'd be you know willing to do this unless I had Aaron as my co-chair so it's definitely going to be a team attack um, so I'm really super excited and there's so many great people to learn from and to work together with and overall I just hope at some point that we are able to do some more things in person this year to spend some more time together and again just really bolster and grow this group and what we do within the chamber and in our communities. So with that being said, the recap from 2021 is that last year's annual meeting at, again was virtual. We had over 30 people in attendance for that meeting. Um, we had some great programming last year which we're going to look to continuing into the year ahead. Um, we did educational opportunities as well as some different networking. So I'll mention some of them. Erin, I'm gonna have you speak to the, um, the Meet the Funders panel because I was not a part of that. But there were three bagels and best practices, including a presentation from Blue Cross Blue Shield Blue Team and their volunteer program, which was very well accepted and appreciated. Um, the education program on storytelling where we had Nancy Frades as our special guest. And I think that was another great program. And then we concluded the year again with Meet the Funder. So Erin, maybe you wanna to speak to that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. I think it had been um, two, maybe three years since we had done the last Meet the Funders. So it was really exciting to bring this event back this year. We had a great turnout. Um, the panel, we, you know, I don't wanna say we got lucky. I think we pulled it together pretty quickly and we got some great names on that panel. Um, we had Jen White from Harbor One Foundation, Dan Solera, Joni Jacksheimer, and um, we had Lauren McDermott from the Boston Foundation, which was good on both ends, really opening her eyes to all of the great nonprofits that are on the South Shore and being able to introduce us to her to hopefully build a larger relationship with the Boston Foundation. Um, it also opened up some doors, I think, to keep the communication there. And hopefully we can um, continue discussions with funders to open their eyes to all of the opportunities for funding. Okay, thanks, Erin. Um, so as we head into 2022, again, you know, we need everybody's participation and support and ideas. So that's kind of going to be our approach going into the new year. So when Aaron and I have spoken a couple times before this, so, and here we are at our annual meeting. Um, for the people on the steering committee, we plan to have our first meeting in February. So we'll be reaching out to all of you. We're targeting February 18th. We normally met on Fridays at 11 and we're going to plan on that, but we'll be communicating with the steering committee. Um, shortly after this meeting. But again, in terms of bagels and best practices and um, the after hours, what we figured 
We're going to talk to the steering committee more. And once we have things set, it will get a schedule out. But we're, what we're looking to do is have our first bagels and best practices on February the 15th and looking to do it the third Tuesday of every other month. And we probably start those at 9 a.m. And then the after hours, we are looking to do the fourth Thursday every other month and then would start that potentially March 24th. And we're targeting mid-April for our first educational program with that subject to be determined and getting feedback from all of you today. And then a potentially our second educational program in mid-October. So we want people as we start this year to really have a sense of when we're looking to do things and knowing that we have the flexibility, all right, we know that Tuesday isn't gonna work, we'll move it to that to Wednesday or Thursday. So have flexibility, but I think if we can all see the year's calendar and sort of use that as a guide, that that will be um, helpful for us. So again, what we're gonna do later in this meeting is have some questions, have some discussions to really see what particularly for the educational programs, what do people wanna focus on? What do you wanna hear more about? What do you wanna learn from, from people in our community or other businesses to, to help us in what we're doing every day in all our different organizations? And again, the bagels and best practices, I think that first one will probably have that be more of an open forum again, and then develop and get ideas from who's there. Do you wanna have the spe uh, speaker in the next month? And how do we wanna work that? And I know for one of the um, after hours that we're hoping to engage with the South Shore, the young professionals group. And so we can engage them a little more as we move forward. And, you know, Julie, I don't know, is, are there any young, anybody from that group that's involved in this group per se? Are there any young professionals that are part of the nonprofit group? So our newest member, Kirsten, um, from she's waving. I can see her on my screen. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, she she is the executive director of the South Shore Children's Chorus, so she might be a nice liaison Good. to that. Yeah, no, so, that's great. I think it's yeah. just important to have input from all yeah. age. Brackets, so it's great that you're a nonprofit and kind of can bridge those two communities. So that's that's great to hear. So. Again, I'm super excited. That's the general concept is to have everybody, you know, have a say in what this group is going to do. And one thing I know, somebody that came off the steering committee who was great from the time I joined it, uh, Lucille Cassis, and I know she was instrumental in the Meet the Funders. You know, we're not going to let people like that go. We she, she already knows that. And same with Lori. So we're going to probably be looking at developing task force for different things. Um, so keep that in mind. So, you know, there is a steering committee, but the steering committee needs support. So I think the task force concept is going to be something that we're going to look towards as well. And again, a shout out to Barbara. I'm the worst note taker there is. So she has been in this role for a long time. And I also super appreciate that you're going to be doing that because it's a thank thankless task and I'm horrible at it. So you've been great. So shout out to you as well. And so, Julie, is it now time for Peter? Or are we ahead? Or uh, actually, I'll I'll jump in first. So um, Peter Foreman will be joining us in just a little bit. He's he's actually on a call with the bank, uh, the South Shore Bank's board of directors. So, um, but he'll be jumping on shortly. But I will start us off with um, a couple of slides here. And, and essentially, um, I'm I want to introduce to you all. If you're not aware of it yet, our um, new membership model. So I will introduce that in just a moment. But first, I want to recognize. Let me get to this slide. Okay. So I want to welcome our 2021 new members who are nonprofit organizations. They are Old Colony Elder Services, OCES. South Shore Charter School, the Marshfield Community Rib Cook-Off, American Red Cross, the Southeastern Massachusetts Chapter, and Hunger New England, the trustees of the reservation. And as I mentioned before, but wanted to know because she came in like just two days ago, South Shore Children's Chorus is our first new nonprofit member um, for 2022. So I wanted to to note that for you all. 
So welcome and thank you for joining us. And so now I'm gonna jump in to um, what I said is our new membership model. So this is something that we have been talking about um, even way before my time here at the chamber. Um, Peter's been at the chamber to celebrate 17 years um, as leading our South Shore Chamber. And I think shortly after arriving, he said, this whole dues model needs to change. Um, but it, it's, it's certainly an undertaking to make something like this happen. Um, and it was one of those bright benefits that came out of a little, little bit of downtime of COVID being able to focus a little bit less events, had some more time to be able to, to do this. Um, it was a, a total team staff effort um, where we worked with a national consultant. Um, it was an opportunity to do this virtually. He is actually based in Oregon, I think. Um, and we did it with a, uh, a cohort of chambers across the US. So it was like actually probably us and six or seven other chambers that went through this over the course of um, the fall of 2020. We introduced this actually in launched this, I should say in March of 2021. Um, all new members are effectively on this model all of our existing members will be moved onto this model over the course of the next three years. So, um, but the biggest takeaway from like the big picture of this is that it's, we're going from like what we called, the industry called fair share dues based on the number of employees. Based, you know, if you were a nonprofit, you got our lowest rate, um, the one to two employee rate and but it was literally just a one size fits all members. It was one level, like one benefit package. And it was definitely not, um, it's not something that really can benefit everyone and like to, to really grow and take advantage of everything that we do. So we took an inventory of all the benefits that we do or can do, and we created these different levels. So now there's options to support your goals. and. Um, we wanted to do this so that all of our members had a choice to be where they wanted to, like where their goals, basically engage our members in opportunities that fit their goals. Um, we wanted to also demonstrate transparent value. I mean, a lot of people for hire were like, what are the benefits? Or like now you read through the menu or the, the guide and you decide where you want to be. Um, and then it really does support the chamber's efforts to grow and evolve as we are a not-for-profit organization ourselves. So it's actually aligning our programming and everything we do through this lens now. I just wanted to share this with you. I don't wanna spend a lot of time, but it does, this is something that the consultant shared with us that I've shared with our boards to show you the, the mindset, the philosophy behind these levels. Um, you know, it's not every, every organization business is not wanting the same from the chamber. Um, so these are, these are the quadrants of, you have aspirational members up on this level and we have transactional members who wanna get something from, like, as, let me take a step back. Aspirational members up here, they wanna get something done. Transactional members, they want to get something from the chamber. And um, my, my video here is getting a little covering some of this, these words, but, um, and the further you go up, the more invested you are, and also the more involved you are, or I should say a little less involved, depending on, on where you're at. But bear with me as I try to go through this pretty quickly. Um, as a on this level is kind of where the base level is and you'll see it in the next slide, how this looks. But as a business builder, you're, you're joining the chamber because you wanna connect and learn. You really wanna like think of it as like networking um, and you're just trying to get to know people and learn about maybe you're a new business and you're just trying to get kind of your feet wet. Moving over here as a business investor, you want, um, you're taking that next level up where you want to actually 
be involved with the chamber and network, but you also may not have the ability to actually get out and network as much. So how can we promote your business um, to the community and, and give you some like marketing exposure, if you will. And then up here, the community builder is where is the person is the type of member that wants um, to be a, more than just transactional. It starts stepping up and wants to be like there for the community represent and also have like their business interests like represented in government, um, leadership development opportunities, et cetera. And then um, as we climb up, it's the community investor where their goal is to like, they want to strengthen the regional economy. They can't be as involved. They don't want to be as involved on like, like networking level. Um, so it's just kind of shows you just a little bit of this mindset. I hope that makes some sense. Let's go to the next slide. Um, these are our new levels or newer levels as we're introduced in March of 21. And as I said, all of our new members coming through are all in this. They all have a choice. You all have a choice too. I'll get to that in a moment. Um, but the now the connector level, which is like the base level, if you will, I don't like to use that word, but that's kind of the starting point. Again, the mindset is invite me to anything. Next up is the brand builder. This is that level that I was saying is still in the transactional mode, wants to still be involved in network and all that and engage them as much as we can, but they can't leave their jobs. They, you know, they might be in the health field or something and they just can't leave. Um, there, this is what we call the make me famous package for a little fun buzz term. It's basically connector level with a marketing package on top of it. So as you could, so it, that's why we call it the brand builder. So that's at $1,000 for the year. As you'll start to hear me, we're starting to build, okay? So you get, as the more you, higher you go, you get all the benefits that fall under, which is in a guide that I will send to you as a recap. Influencer is at 2,500. You kind of, you're kind of in between. You're like, I want to be more, but I can't afford more, but I want I want to be more than just networking, um, and I want to, to be able to be more involved on a higher level, but I'm not quite there yet. It's a little bit of a middle ground for those folks. And then our stakeholder and change maker start to really get you to those levels where you're engaged in the room. Your, your access is there. Um, so I'm going to get you actually to that next slide because I find I'm like repeating myself here. Um, what it means for your nonprofit. So wearing the hat um, of it being in your shoes, what does this mean for you guys and how I can translate this? Number one, you're not gonna lose benefits. If you stay as a connector at the 500 level, what you know of your membership with the chamber in these years was is not changing. So, um, and, and like, as I mentioned, in fact, like our benefit offerings will increase if you go above that. So you will actually be introduced and get to take advantage of more benefits the higher the levels you go. We want to shift the mindset to be more like, I want you to think which level really suits my organization's needs. Again, no more of this one size fits all. Let's give you people options. Um, and it gives you the control to decide where you see yourself. So I um, want you to kind of think about that. Other um, benefits is that it offers you more opportunities to engage in our economic and community development work. And I think this is last point is very, like would really resonate with you all is like, as you climb that ladder, it means access access to our leadership, to resources, to information, et cetera. Like it's more concierge um, and it's, you're just brought to the, you know, to forums, to the table with us much more. So that might actually be something that appeals to a lot of nonprofits and not certainly all of you, um, but it's just, where do you see yourself? Um, happy to have conversations. I know Peter jumped on just a couple minutes ago, so I don't want to take much more time. Um, 
happy to have conversations with you one-on-one, -on -one, myself and Jill O'Brien, um, who many of you have met as our engagement lead. You know, let's talk about what your goals are. Let's see if we can recommend a level and if that meets you. If you've already paid your dues, you're fine. Like I said, this is a three-year pro process of getting people, our existing members onboarded. If you wanna take advantage of something like this now, we're happy to talk. Um, but right, you know, you is eventually we just need to, we need to get everyone shifted onto the model. So at, at three-year mark, it will be $500 dues at the minimum, okay? So that's probably the quickest I've ever said all that. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to, I'm gonna stop share here and welcome Peter Foreman. Hopefully you've had a chance to have a sip of water between your, your, your meetings. Um, but uh, Peter Foreman is our CEO and president. And Peter, just before you joined, I was explaining that, or announcing that you have been with the chamber 17 years, right, this month? So, uh, what's that? 17 or 18. 17 or 18, oh gosh. I've got to go back and look. <laughs> So I'm just going to turn it over to you for a few minutes to, uh, to let you take the floor. Great. Thanks, Julie. And um, I thought what I'd do, we've been um, obviously spending a lot of time trying to read tea leaves on how COVID changes the economy and what that means to um, the South Shore and our South Shore 2030 economic plan. And uh, I just made a presentation to South Shore Bank about some of what we're seeing. Thought I would uh, share some of it with you, uh, some points that might affect nonprofits. Um, and uh, hopefully some of you, whether today or offline, can uh, help weigh in on some of the things you're seeing with business changes or government changes and um, uh, the regional uh, recovery. We're expecting, uh, that two conflicting forces are, are going to be coming here with municipalities uh, in, in the recovery. One is that towns are gonna become more competitive with each other for business development and government money. Uh, they're going to become a little less inclined to think about how they fit into an entire region. Uh, and they're gonna be more competitive. This is partly because Towns are facing uh, more challenge with talent recruitment, just like every other employer. Uh, we're beginning to, uh, we expect to see some exodus of um, public administrators and uh, uh, people who have been filling town halls. Uh, so towns will become more competitive for that. They're gonna be more competitive for government money and there's renewed interest uh, by towns for business attraction and economic development. Um, while it's great to see some of that energy, if it's just focused to specific towns and not thinking regionally, that affects the overall regional economy. The plus side from our perspective is I expect that state government and the new governor next year is, uh, is going to have renewed interest in regionalization. The, the state officials and uh, federal officials, if they are involved in some way, do understand that uh, economic activity is regional, it is not municipal. And they look to make investments that benefit a larger area than just single uh, towns. Now, I mentioned this because nonprofits can play an important role in helping towns and in helping people think regionally. Um, I know a lot of you are gonna be uh, looking for more government funding and uh, nonprofits can help uh, regionalize activity because none of you are really confined to any municipality and uh, serving just people in any one town. So you have uh, a great DNA in generalizing the benefits of government investment uh, in communities. And where towns are going to be chasing money, towns are, are increasing, even though they're, they're maybe going to be looking more parochial parochially than regional, uh, they are stepping up their collaboration. 
Um, I think they'll be stepping up their, their interest in collaboration, um, uh, if not with other towns, certainly with other agencies like the chamber or nonprofits. So uh, we think nonprofits are, are um, in a good position to help uh, mediate so, sort of this yin and yang of towns maybe acting more locally, state wanting to act more regionally, and, and um, many of you can play an important bridge role in that. Uh, we're expecting to see a lot more entrepreneurial activity. Um, as, as boomers start to retire a little earlier and sell off businesses, as we continue to see more of the roll up of businesses into national companies, which we think is bad, uh, does not help our economy. We do think that it unleashes a lot of entrepreneurial effort as um, uh, mid-level, upper-level professionals start to get laid off or decide they don't want to work for national companies uh, or publicly traded companies, or they don't want to work in the towers in Boston anymore. Uh, we expect to see an increase of uh, business startups and people working um, for themselves uh, and that probably works to the South Shore's advantage because we have a strong DNA of that anyway, of people who moved here and then got tired of working in Boston, setting up their own operations. We think that accelerates. Uh, and in the long run, that's good because that's going to be the seed corn for future small businesses uh, that are adding jobs. Uh, I mentioned that to you because I think there's going to be new opportunity for all of you to find um, uh, potential new small businesses who can help. Now, always hard to chase the small dollars rather than the big dollars, but any part of development is uh, grooming those future uh, leaders. And I think we're gonna start to see a lot more of those entrepreneurs, small businesses, who in time will become the leaders and funders of community activities and nonprofits. It's gonna be new energy in the workforce. Uh, we're expecting, no secret, I think all of you are too, we're expecting musical chairs. A lot of people leaving businesses um, or careers and starting new ones. This is sort of the, the new discovery of uh, life work balance that came out of COVID. Uh, we do agree with all of the, um, projections everyone's making nationally that this will step up. Uh, I don't think we're immune to that. And I think it's actually good. There's a lot of transaction costs uh, for businesses when, when uh, there's turnover of employees. But in the long run, uh, I think what it's going to do is um, infuse our businesses with a lot of new energy. It's going to uh, really um, re-energize uh, employees, uh, uh, kind of thinking new, a fresh start. I think that brings a lot of energy both to organizations uh, and to the community. They're going to be looking at how to get involved. Um, uh, how, how do they uh, step up their game if they're changing careers? And I think that may create some interesting opportunities uh, for leadership development for your boards and volunteers as well. Um, and as we get those younger professionals coming out of Boston, that expands the pool of potential volunteers. Again, all a little hard because you've got to find them, you've got to groom them, but I do think there's a whole new generation of, of uh, volunteers. Um, we are expecting the new work dynamic to continue, that being that there's more flexibility in remote work. We don't think that it's um, going to be universal, that everyone's just working at home and nobody's going back to Boston and into the towers. That's not realistic. But I do think uh, that what we're going to see is most larger corporations uh, allowing people the flexibility of working at home one or two days a week, not five days a week, but one or two. That makes a huge difference, though. If you have a lot of companies doing that and people are spending 20% more of their week at home in towns, um, that also frees up some opportunity for people to be more engaged in their communities and their kids' activities and, and whatever. Uh, that's 
potential gain for um, for nonprofits uh, as well. Again, with that that leadership uh, force, we have some concerns. Uh, there are things we're looking for that aren't going to be as positive. We think for the region and going to be a challenge to us. Um, when we started our economic plan, one of the things we looked at when we did a deep dive into the South Shores economy uh, was that um, our economy is too heavily weighted to residential service economy, retail, uh, for example, um, uh, or uh, hospitality, restaurants, all of that. Uh, great for quality of life everyone likes to shop everyone likes to eat but those aren't necessarily highest paying jobs and they keep the money in the area and the key to getting wealth is bringing more money from outside the area into a region and uh, we were concerned with 2030 of how do we expand and diversify our business base so that there are higher paying jobs and more money is coming from outside the area introducing new wealth, not necessarily new wealthy people, but new wealth to the area uh, that then gets circulated through the residential service economy. We may see a little slip back into um, more emphasis on that service economy. And the question we'll have is, uh, does, does that create new opportunity with niche services and higher level services expected out of the new economy. And that service economy can actually produce a little bit more wealth than it did in the past. Um, or is it gonna be a slip back into too many options just with lower paying jobs? And how does that attract business and new people to the area? If you have that, we become a less wealthy area, which affects you with donors, but it's also gonna affect nonprofits with increased demand for services. Uh, so the, the effort uh, that we have in trying to diversify our economic base, we think becomes more challenging in some ways with the recovery. And uh, we're gonna to have to try to, to accelerate some of the strategies we were looking for earlier to try to, to uh, create an environment where um, new businesses come in, start up here and we have higher paying jobs. We're uh, concerned, continue to be concerned about the leadership issue on the South Shore. Who are the next generation of leaders? As the boomers accelerate their retirement um, and uh, pass off their businesses or sell off to, to national companies, uh, the big question is who in the private sector is going to be stepping up to help lead the area, not just their business, but step up and support the nonprofits, support community development, help take a leadership role in helping groups like the chamber define what some of the regional initiatives are. A um, little bit of hope for us because we are gonna see some new migration of younger people but we've got to be in the business of trying to groom them and step up and be involved in the community and, and on boards like yours. Uh, we're uh, a little concerned about wealth exodus from the state, new work situations, the selling of businesses. If uh, the baby boom business owners sell off and uh, take their money with them to Florida, what's that mean for giving for you? Uh, that's a concern. If we have things like the millionaire tax referendum that passed next year, this year, um, it, does that accelerate the movement of pretty successful wealthy people leaving the state? And uh, if they do, that's just less ties to our community. That's less money coming in. So uh, we're watching the wealth exodus, not just for economic development, but uh, nonprofits have to be concerned with that as well, because that's going to mean stepping up the effort in replacing larger donors with a lot more smaller donors. And we all know how much work's involved with that. It's really uh, challenging. Uh, and then we're uh, just looking at this issue of regional collaboration 
um, as I mentioned with towns and trying to, to figure out how do we all stretch? You're all in the same boat that, that we are. I think we're ahead of everybody in the private sector and government in recognizing that the way to get things done uh, is through a level of specialization, but then collaboration with partners of all types to actually move something. And uh, I think that's going to be challenging for a lot of people, but it's, it's uh, where a lot more of our focus is going to be as a chamber and with uh, 2030. So, so those are some of the, the things we're observing in COVID and watching for with recovery that we think affect our work, affect the economy, and they affect you. And would love to hear, Julie, I don't know how how your schedule is, but if people have any thoughts about what they're seeing out there um, that might fit into any of that narrative, um, reinforcing it or knocking it down, I'd love to hear. Well, we were actually um, going to move into like the, the section of just of like kind of an open form discussion with a little facilitated guided, but Christine, are you good with it just taking maybe no, absolutely. A couple of comments or thoughts or questions for Peter, if anyone has, who wants to jump, just unmute yourself. Peter, thanks so up. much. Oh, for, sure. Thanks so much for giving us the, the, the lowdown on the region, <laughs> at least <laughs> your, your vision of what's going on. And I think that that's the tea leaves from our cup of coffee and our tea. You, know, you, assume you are all are drinking yeah. out of slightly different cups. So that's why I'd like to compare notes. Yeah, no, I think actually you, you're spot on with many of those observations. I was glad that you were sharing them. Um, and I guess I would say too, that uh, regionalization is is definitely uh, obviously something that we as a watershed association have always been for. Um, and I hope that the government, uh, as they dangle money out there, uh, requires it as part of, of playing so that people will not be duplicating efforts and that they will actually be working together and encouraged to work together. Because as you know, um, yeah, otherwise it, it just becomes a competition. Uh, between our communities to get the resource. Um, so I think that nonprofits play, uh, can play a significant role in bringing our communities together, uh, particularly as it comes to grant funding from the state or uh, the feds. And I hope that, um, that, that they will encourage nonprofits to apply on behalf of and with in support of our communities who don't necessarily have the capacity to apply um themselves yep uh they don't they're they're um in some areas i think they're going to be hollowing out of that professional development so some of us are going to have to help up step up and help them with their own grant writing but um we will play a role because as they're looking for that money and looking for partners i think we all have an opportunity to say you're spot on with what you're trying to do we can help you make it better and be more competitive if you look at it um about how your project actually advances a regional interest and let's try to regionalize it a little bit um town officials have a hard time going to town meeting or their voters who all say hey this is our tax dollar our project we don't care about the neighboring town i think if they have partners who say oh no this we're going to be more successful because other towns are looking at it and it it helps and, and we'll be able to expand that scope of vision in ways that um, a lot of town officials aren't able to. Mm -hmm. I guess I would also just mention, since we have all the nonprofits together, that that idea of collaboration, uh, not just amongst our communities, but amongst ourselves, is something that we should be thinking about as nonprofits. You know, how can our nonprofit dif different interests get out of our silos and try to see if there's some way to to work together uh, to, to, to broaden the, the work that we do um, and make it, make it more meaningful in a regional sense. So just a thought about, um, you know, collaborations, thinking outside the box and the opportunities that our NPO group here might be able to foster some, some of that. 
So anyways, thanks, Peter. That was, I thought it was a really interesting perspective. I'm going to share some of your thoughts at a retreat I'm going to next Monday with our board. <laughs> now, now, Sam, looking at the background, I'm actually in Florida, so I have almost as nice a background out my window. You people have snow. Uh, but uh -huh. looking, looking at that background, I just want to remind you, you offered the chamber staff a pontoon ride up the river. That's right. Spring <laughs> is coming. Summer's coming. This, so let's, yes. Let's May 15th collaborate. is when the boat goes in. <laughs> let's collaborate on getting the uh, chamber staff out on the river. All right. Yes, definitely. For sure. <laughs> Anyone else? That was great. Thanks, Sam. I just want to say that was a smooth move, Samantha. <laughs> okay, so, um, all right, shall we move on, Christine? I will guide the, the polls and do you want to- Yeah, Julie's put together some nice interactive polling. So we're, they're broken out into different categories. One's event planning. One's workforce, one's strategic planning, and then priorities to help identify our topics for the year. So we'll go one at a time. Erin's going to help me out with this. So Julie, sure. Launch a little away. bit of a crowdsource uh, polling questions from the steering team. So not solely me. So hopefully this will all work here. Hold on. All right. Can you all see this? Okay. Yes. Thank you. So if everyone does the, what, four questions here, and then it's going to give us the feedback pretty quickly, and then we'll have some open discussion. Yeah. So once I see everyone's participated or uh, pretty close, I will launch the results, share the results. I think that's probably, oh no. All right, I'm gonna end the poll and share results. So I'm hoping you can all see that. Yep, okay. that's great. All right, so in terms of, we'll just kind of review these re results overall and then kind of open up the discussion. Mm -hmm. Oh, has the recent Omicron surge caused you to change an event from virtual in person? That's can't get a more even split than that. A little <laughs> fifty. Um, is your organization planning in person events for 2022? I love seeing that number 91 percent because that gives me hope, and that's where I'm hoping. Hope that number goes up next time we talk. Um, if yes, what kind of events? I think that's good too. We have a smattering that. The big galas are coming back around. You know, I think all these things are important. Still having smaller events. And then I know I was under others because we do a lot of walks and runs. You know, we're national organizations and we're getting good feedback for that later in the year. So I think that's great. And are you comfortable gathering in person? Um, yes, no, it depends on size. So again, mix, encouraging to see 50% are at yes. Um, obviously I think it does make sense on the size of an event and yeah, again, for those who are not, again, that's understandable as well. And just hopefully, you know, that will change as we get into going into 2022. So does anyone have any comments or things they want to ask specifically to this group, um, about events, about being in person and just, or what you've had may have experienced already. Rick, I know you pulled off a great event in early December. That was awesome to see. Yeah, it uh, was a different world in early December than it was right now. Like seriously, I've had a couple of groups reach out to us and say, hey, what did you guys do? And our experience of December 3rd does not apply to January 3rd or February 3rd. Um, we had a successful in-person event 
that did not turn into a successful super spreader event, which, you know, we were, we, we, everybody had to be vaccinated that came to the event, but even now, that would make a difference with our mission, you know? Um, I feel for everybody who's playing in person events right now, but if things return to how they were on December 3rd, if we get to this third, our guests felt comfortable attending. We heard very few, we offered uh, a virtual option, and we only had about 40 people that actually took us up on that virtual option. So we did a hybrid for the, for the event. Um, so at that point, December 3rd, most people felt, felt comfortable coming. Um, and so I hope that when we get back to normal and we're after this surge and people start feeling comfortable again, um, you know, we we'll get back to that normal, more normal. Great. Does anyone else have anything they want to ask or share to the group? Regarding so my Martin Luther King has always been huge for us uh, year by year by year, even uh, throughout all the Martin Luther Kings of the pandemic. Um, we had about 300 people in shifts and waves, about 75 or 80 people at a time come and pack. We've had 100,000 people um, through a mobile event that we had in Providence, did 20,000. We did about 80 at, in Pembroke um, to spread meals out around the, the South Shore. Um, we can't really stop. As long as we have funding, we, we've got to pack the meals because people need to eat. <laughs> And it's cold and they're struggling to heat their homes and feed their kids. Um, but everybody who's been coming for the 22 months of the pandemic is used to social distancing, is used to working in clumps like family, the people they drive with to the warehouse, they, they work next to each other. Um, so we have just kind of adapted how we do what we do uh, and we're just chugging along. But we have a 5,000 square foot warehouse. Some of these things are not able to be held in a gigantic space uh, either. So we, we're just kind of set up to, to be able to do it. We just want to continue to get funding, get meals out to the South Shore and throughout New England. Um, but we just did that three days ago. That's great. Good to hear. Anybody else? I think the um, the environments with the gala are always tricky because there's usually a food component and a drink component and your mask is down, right? So yeah. um, in addition to requiring um, either proof of vaccine or a negative COVID test, we're considering um, reducing table size in, at some of our events. And maybe then um, you have more of a possibility of sitting next to people who you're kind of in a cohort with, like to your point, Matthew, people that are already kind of driving together. Um, and I think this will probably be most likely, hopefully, more of an issue at our March event, which feels like very soon versus, you know, what we have coming down the line in May. But um, those are some of the things, you know, I'm sure you're all considering them too, but that's what we're doing. I know we're doing something in conjunction with Children's Hospital in May. So, I mean, they already said it has to be virtual. So there's no ifs, ands, or buts. So definitely it seems larger institutions, and I know, someone working with Harvard to accredit a course and they're not even looking to consider in person until July. So when I started hearing that stuff at the beginning of the year, I got super nervous, but I do think these large corporate entities and universities are definitely very different than what we do and they have to plan so much further ahead. But I'll have to say it didn't make me feel too good about 2022 as I just hired two new people for just that started January 10th. So we'll see what happens. Christine? Uh, Christine? Yes. Can you hear me? Um, picking up on Laurie's comment, one of the things we've looked at at large events uh, was whether or not our larger members who buy tables are going to feel comfortable asking their employees or clients to come events to events. So I was curious when Laurie said looking at reducing the size of the tables, I know that she meant it for safety, but have any of you been looking at reducing table size so it's easier for your large donors to fill a table? Let's talk about experience at our gala in December. Most of the large employers had policies that wouldn't allow their employees to attend. Exactly. In December. And even though, so we significantly reduced the number of tickets that we were giving to the sponsors, which was 
wonderful because it freed up more space in the room for us, the individuals. And that was to our ticket sales at an event where we were at half capacity. Normally we had 500 people, we passed it at 250. We had higher ticket sale numbers than we've ever had in the past. Well, it, it, it seems, uh, you know, it seems weird, that, but it's because the number of people in the room weren't all corporate guests. Um, and so we reduced the ticket numbers. Corporate guests were fine with it. The corporate partners were because they weren't sending people anyway. And frankly, we probably won't ever put the numbers back up that we did with the number of tickets that went with the corporate sponsorship because they weren't the ones that were bidding or, or playing games. They were just there for a free dinner a lot of times. Um, so if you're looking for volume uh, and getting a lot of people in there, the corporate partners were fine. But for us, we were, we were looking for getting the right people in the room. Um, this is a silver lining for us for the event. Yeah. Thanks, Rick. Anyone else have anything to add on this subject? Hi, this this is Kim. Um, I with Oak Colony Elder Services, and we, I mean, we didn't do it recently, but we did have an event because we have had volunteers being delivering Meals on Wheels throughout the whole pandemic. And some of them are taking up a lot. I mean, been doing this and we've lost a lot of people. So we felt it was really important to have an in-person appreciation. And we actually been looking at adjusting our calendar to do more events spring or fall when the weather's nice so it can be outside. So that's what we did with them. We ended up doing it in the fall in an outside kind of um, with a band and just an appreciation. And we're gonna do it again this year. I think one question I have on one of these side questions um, for the people who aren't comfortable gathering, we had about 18%, like what would your time frame be or what would need to change for you to feel comfortable? I think right now from my perspective, it seems like um, after the Omicron wave kind of goes by, which we hope it will, and that there's not some other new wave of something else that we haven't thought of yet. But um, I think it's being nimble and and being able to, um, you know, kind of watch the data and then see if uh, you know the numbers are down. I think it was just the this wave that kind of sent us. We we were just kind of getting back into a little bit more normal groove, just about, and then things went south. Um, I will sort of speak to Kim's point. We, we um, quickly last fall, uh, even still our, our board wasn't quite ready for, and we didn't think people were ready for in-person indoor meeting. And so we made our annual meeting outdoors um, and we moved it up to October. We usually traditionally do it in November. We were blessed with incredible weather and uh, everybody loved it so much that we'll never do it inside again. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, it helps that we're an outdoor based nature based organization. So it, for, you know, for those who are following us, they're already interested in being outside probably. So, um, so yeah, I think the idea of doing more outdoor things in person, um, and maybe smaller groups inside in the winter, um, might be the, the way to go until, till till when, I don't know. <laughs> And I know with a lot of the people we work with, the virtual thing is just, it's not really accepted anymore. People are tired of it. And, it, and again, it's because of the nature of the types of events, they're more athletic, the runs and the walks and things like that. And, you know, people are just getting tired of putting a shirt on and filming themselves and saying, you know, walking alone or taking the dog out and saying and posting, oh, I did this. They miss the community and being together with people. So Again, for us, the 2022, we're busier spring to fall. So I'm just hoping that we are more live because some people who did push through virtually, you know, just are not willing to do that again. So we'll see what happens. 
Uh, so this is Marianne. So I actually just wrote a little blurb for the Hingham Anchor about how we can stop Omicron. And I think that I work for Mass General Brigham and our policy is we were, we sponsored Raymond 400 and we did not, we donated our tickets back. The policy is still, you know, gathering is not really uh, something that we want to do at this moment, especially with Omicron. But the biggest thing that everybody can do is wear a mask and wear a mask that fits you well and that you're going to wear. And I think that unfortunately that's not going to go away. Um, you get boosted, um, vaccinated, and I, you know, what is I work in the healthcare field. They, I don't work on site and hats off to all of my colleagues because it is really, really stressful and they're doing the best that they can. Um, always patient care is number one. So I feel like, uh, you know, working with people um, that, you know, moving, like I don't have any in-person events. Um, if you see me at an in-person event, I'm the, probably the only one that has a mask on, but I just feel like that's the way it is moving forward. And um, I don't know, I don't think anybody really has the answers, but um, yeah. And I'm on the board of Rotary Responsibility and Erin, we have this conversation all the time that the board is divided, but um, just, you know, wait and see. But I do think that outside and good weather is our friend, Sam. So being nature-based is good. Is this a topic that interests people going forward as Christine and I, you know, build out the plan for the year? Is this an educational event or a networking event where we can talk about best practices of either events that we've all held or bringing in somebody externally to talk about this. Um, I mean, I feel like sometimes in development, we could just go on and on and on about events and either complain or share best practices mm -hmm. and things, um, but just wanna really get your feedback of, is this a hot topic specifically of events in 2022? Unfortunately, I think it is. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I was hoping it wouldn't be true, but. Um, and it's yeah. ever changing. So it's a hard discussion to have, I think. But personally, um, you know, we're looking at in person in September, which seems far away. But now everything that's happening sort of makes us take a step back and think it's not that far away. And is 2022 going to be different? Um, but personally, I know I've talked with Serendi. I've talked with Rick, just trying to get people's input that have done it. Um, so hopefully that would be helpful to the rest of the group as well if we shared some best practices and things like that. Can I chime in really quick with yeah. something? Um, just what we've sort of done, we're the South Shore Children's Chorus, and um, I also think just recognizing that it can be different for parents and students, for those of us who work with children, um, because they have been in school and they have been masked. Um, and they're just more used to kind of like, you go, you do the best you can. And that's how, that's how we roll. Um, we've been doing in-person all year. We did in-person summer camp and, and we actually have the most enrollment we've ever seen. Hmm. So I think that's sort of the flip side of everything is that, you know, there are a lot of people that are looking for ways to get out and to in, you know, attend in-person events and just remembering that, you know, those experiences, it can actually, if, if you do it right and you're careful and you do the best you can, that right now actually might be a really good time. We're seeing, as I said, we're seeing more kids wanting to be enrolled, more people wanting to attend our events and have a, actually a greater annual budget because we are offering in person at the best we can. So um, just like another flip side on the other hand to think about. I would have to agree with that. And every family kind of has another family, whether it's cousins or just a neighborhood thing that they are willing to come with and serve alongside of. So we're not talking about galas or appreciation things, but just like volunteering kids um when people walk in they're like almost everybody has a mask on but when they don't you just hand them a mask and they put it on because i just tell them i've got kids in high school they have to wear a mask all day so whenever we're indoors i go indoors for 10 minutes two other people are in the room i put a mask on i go to unload products somewhere and if one person has a mask on i slip a mask on just for the comfort level of the people i'm working with and some people um that's just how they roll more and more people i think all the time because they're just aware of how other people feel about what's happening now. And we just want to err on the set of caution. 
Um, the governor yesterday said that the Omicron has peaked. It went way up and way down in a lot of places and that we're on that roller coaster here, but we're on the way down a few more weeks. It might be a much different situation. I don't know if it's December 3rd again, like Rick was saying, but hopefully it'll be a lot closer to that than what it was three days ago. But you do, we just have to keep going on, especially with crucial work, um, especially with kids and feeding kids or offering services to kids. It's just there's so much that has to be done that we just have to figure out how to do it, I think. And, and people, if vaccinations are required, masks are required, and they can't make it, they, they can't make it, but other people will come in and make it. I think something I will just add before, Christine, we can jump into the next round is that I, and this is what we struggled with probably across the board here, um, definitely here at the chamber and prior to a pandemic was that you can't be everything to everyone. So keeping, so that's what's, like Kirsten, I can see your head nodding. And it's like, that's what was coming into my mind as you were sharing. So thank you for that. But I, it's like, we have, we just have to keep things in perspective that way too. So, but why don't we jump into the next poll? Um, let me see. This one is on just some workforce questions. Just get a pulse on what's going on for everyone and what you may know for your organization. I think there's only... Yeah, there's four questions to answer here. Give it another few seconds. Okay. So I'm going to end the poll and share results. Thanks, Julie. I'm going to read through this one for you guys. Um, interested to hear sort of your feedback from your organizations. I think obviously us in development, it's a little different than looking at, um, you know, like with Road to Responsibility, our direct care staff. Um, so it looks like we're all kind of in the same boat, recruiting talent, retaining talent, um, sort of split in terms of work-life balance. Um, and again, split, are you considering downsizing? No. Um, I wanted to sort of just chime in and talk about some of the um, recruitment challenges and retaining because with our direct care staff, they had to be on site. They didn't have the option to work at home, um, you know, and that still goes. So we have about 80% women who have children at home. And so they didn't have a choice. They had, they had to come to work. Um, so we lost a lot of our workforce and a lot of them didn't come back. Um, so that's where we're seeing challenges, and I'm interested to hear what others think about that as well. Uh, we lost more of our workers in this last round because their children were in school coming home and the, and the worker got uh, fully vaxxed workers getting, getting Omicron. So. Has, hasn't been the same, but the, mm -hmm. but the finding of new workers and uh, those guys must be going somewhere. I think to take it back to something that Peter mentioned earlier, I think the, the pandemic has really caused a lot of people to take a look at their careers and realize that maybe the path they were on isn't the uh, the path they want to continue down. And so that, you know, opens the doors and, you know, through some of my recent searches, I came across some very talented individuals who had some really impressive skill sets, but just weren't necessarily the right fit for what I was looking for. And that's where I think, and I know I've had conversations with a couple of you here on this, on this um, call, referring those individuals, maybe they weren't the right fit for us. But I think we're going to see a nice influx of maybe new talent that, that are coming from private sector and um, I think it's important to continue these conversations because again, even if um, we're recruiting a, a person who maybe is not 
not the right fit for our particular organization. I think networking within this group and, and passing those leads around on introducing folks to each other, I think that that benefits the, the group as a collective. Absolutely, and I think that raises a good point, Paul, to, to see people's career changes and maybe that that eventually will swing to benefit the nonprofit field. People that are leaving the city, leaving corporate life, looking for a different change. I mean, I know that that's one of the things that our um, HR team is really going to start pushing in the new year now is a new career, a meaningful job. Um, you know, people are sort of sick of that corporate life and hopefully we can start to recruit them into the nonprofit field as they start to look at new career changes. I think for us, I mean, we were very short staffed because when COVID came, we had to let people go. So we got through to, like I said, we just hired someone for development, which is a new position here and for events in 2021. And I just think, yeah, the work-life balance, we've kind of been pretty good about having that here, but it's just very different now. And it really has to be addressed at the get-go and the interview stages. You know, one person has a young daughter in school, so that's super different. I have a staff member who's been here about eight years and she's a new grandmother and takes care of her granddaughter now one day a week. So there's that consideration. You know, I've always had my parents recently lost my mom, but I see them every day. My dad's 91 and there's other people I know that are taking care of their older parents. So everyone, you know, with Omicron and the pandemic, things have changed so much. So there are so many different considerations at different levels of people's individual lives. And I do feel organizations have to consider that now. And so many people have figured out people can work from home. Um, you know, and I like to be with people and I like having people in the office, um, but certainly having that flexibility, making people be able to do what they need to do in their personal life and be safe when they come here is certainly important. I think it provides pros and cons for sure. I mean, silver linings of hopefully as we move forward, we can keep some hybrid options. I think it provides convenience for people that maybe can't attend in person or so many meetings now, it's funny to look at my calendar that they're back to back and I can attend all of them because I don't have to drive in between. So I've really seen increased attendance and in networking events and other meetings. So hopefully some of that will stick around as we move forward past COVID. Does anybody else have any other comments on either hybrid work or recruiting talent? Yeah, I got, the, one, yeah. I got one thing. Um, so our challenge really is filling those entry level positions, you know, those paid internships and whatnot. And we've seen that really, you know, that talent pool significantly decrease since COVID. So currently we're trying to look at you know, how can we work around these problems? You know, what are our solutions? But, you know, we've seen on a, on a small level at, at that entry level that we're not getting the talent we used to get, you know, prior to. There's so much out there, right, Jonathan? I mean, we're seeing the same thing. Why would somebody come work for us when they could go to Target for more money? I mean, that's just... I also think it's ambition too. Like they, like they're like with us, you have to be out sometimes, you know, and people are like, Oh, I can't just do everything from my house or something like that. I think that's one of the challenges too, being in the production world yeah. is that occasionally you do have to get out and film something. I think this is three questions. Can't hear you, Oh, you can't hear me? I can hear you now. I can okay. see you talking, but I couldn't hear you. I don't know if it was just me. <laughs> okay. Uh, we'll move on to round three. Uh, strategic planning is the topic. There's only three questions here. Just curious about your plans.
like we're close to full response. I give it about a quick minute. <laughs> so, all right, I'll end the poll here and share results. All righty, strategic planning. Does your organization have a current strategic plan? Most of us do, that's great. Um, if yes, what is the timeline view of the strategic plan? Uh, majority of that two to five years. I think that's not surprising. And has mm -hmm. it caused you to permanently alter your strategic plan? So that's kind of a pretty even split. So mm -hmm. that's kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. Yes. We have, for us, I mean, we have a strategic plan that's in place that was a five year strategic plan and I think we're in that third year of it. So, I mean, yeah, obviously the pandemic has made everybody shift. It certainly changed things, like I said, the last few years, but now I feel what's in our strategic plan is something that we can go back to providing, you know, that this surge of Omicron comes down in the next month or so. If not, and then if there's another variant, yeah, that's certainly going to change things for us and our outlook moving forward. But for now, we're just kind of holding steady with what we have and hoping that we've been through the worst and then see where we go. So what are other people experiencing with their strategic plans and maybe your board's perspective of that and their expectations of you? If anything, I think it's just sort of slowed things down. I don't think it's made us change anything permanently. Um, but I think that, you know, we've all sort of used COVID as an excuse over the past couple of years. So I think that definitely comes into play with strategic plans as well. Um, I'd be interested to hear from people that, you know, permanently changed their strategic plan. Was that something good that came out of the pandemic? Um, you know, a silver lining that you found and transitioned differently? Ours is more of just, uh, we've had to switch the way we do stuff because everything we did was mobile. So we, I serve all of New England. So I'd always go wherever, do the thing, the meals would stay in that area. Not necessarily municipality, but like county wide. And now we're talking much more regionally. Um, so if you ever see when meals fly out of our warehouse, I always say it's the South Shore, it's Boston Metro, it's, you know, Western Mass. It's, it's not like going to this town necessarily. It's going to an area just because we've had to shift everything we do. And we've noticed that people are parochial in that they're not just sending donations from the other five states of New England to us to pack meals to go out. They still want to do it in their area. They just can't do it yet. So we've had to kind of shift our whole focus into how do we just do them around here and get all the money we get from around here to keep going until people feel comfortable doing more mobile type things. People are super comfortable coming to our warehouse because it's gigantic. So our strategy has switched because our the landscape has shifted dramatically, I guess. So just out of that necessity, we've had to try to figure out how to get more funds so that we can do more stuff around here while we wait for the other stuff to open up a little bit more. And I saw in chat, thank you, Matthew, from Kirsten, saying that her organization is newer and she they don't have a strategic plan. She's one of those people. So you know, potentially, Aaron, that could be something that's either something that we talk about further for programming or best practices. Um, and they're not that difficult and people look at them and want to do things different ways. And they're certainly personal to your organization. But I mean, I'm sure some of us can share drafts or templates or formats, but maybe it's something to talk about and how strategic plans maybe have to be more flexible moving forward. So that I think maybe potentially be an interesting topic for people going forward. Anyone else have anything to add? So with us, um, you know, because we do have a lot of frontline workers, not necessarily in my area, uh, a couple of things have happened. We we're in what's called a HICS now, where we have um, the hospital's incident command center meets daily about um, patient needs and staffing needs and those types of things. And we recently had um, 100 non-clinical people 
be shifted over to the hospital to work. So they're, you know, whatever they're doing in their area has totally stopped. They were over there for three weeks, helping out doing uh, patient support things, transporting patients, serving food, um, at the front desk, helping to, you know, get people in or out or whatever needs to be done. And we were just talking about it in our team meeting yesterday that you still have your goals, you still have your strategic plan. But when you're in this crisis mode, you know, for us, it's been the last three weeks, we are seeing it get better. Omicron is ending in the next two weeks, this, this surge should be over. Um, we anticipate it will be over. But you you go from a time period where, you know, you're going along, you, you're, you're working on your strategy plans and you're working on your goals and those types of things. And all of a sudden everything stops <laughs> and you're just in incident, get through this. Um, and, and how do you get back into making sure that you are still working on your strategy? So it, it is definitely, um, I think, a topic that we could explore more down the road this year. I think because flexibility I think it, seems to be the key. Yeah. If everybody's flexible with work-life balance and crisis now and getting back <laughs> to whatever later, that's just the way we've got to roll. Yep. Yep. All right. And anyone else? Because I think we're coming up to the 1030. So I just want to get in this last. It's one question, but I think the way I position it is to um, get your to choose only three, but it's to gauge our prior, uh, gauge priorities to help us identify educational topics um, for the year. So, you know, just kind of looking at this kind of broad list, obviously we have, I think we have some great notes and takeaways from the conversation so far, far but please just pick three. It's not prioritizing your one, two or three, just pick three. It looks like it's only letting us pick yeah. one, Julie. Pick one. Oh no. Yeah, pick one. Okay, pick one. <laughs> yeah. And then as we close it out, um, we can discuss. It. Oh, it is single choice. I see that now. Sorry. I thought I was going to get yeah, a gold I think star that, for these polls. <laughs> you still do, Julie. <laughs> I would just say, you know, on behalf of Christine and I, if there's any burning topics that you really want to discuss, either throw them in the chat, email us afterwards. Um, yeah. We really want to plan a year that you all want to be a part of. So, you know, just don't be shy. All right. So I think that's, let me end this. End it and share results. So it looks, you know, it's donor relationships, recurring giving, retaining talent, attracting talent. So like a whole kind of uh, HR kind of focus on that. Adoption of DEI, some have that. And the strategic planning, which is probably, I would say in order it, oh my gosh, it's tied for recurring giving prioritizing relationships with donors, not surprised with this group on here. <laughs> and then uh, strategic planning would be the top three. So yeah, and I think then, we could certainly have an interesting conversation about giving and donors sort of, you know, even putting those two together and how has your relationship changed with donors over the past couple of years? Yep, um, donor relations, yeah. Yeah, and even you know, recurring giving, we've, we've been lucky enough at RTR to see our donations increase over the past couple of years. And is that something that is a result of COVID that is going to stick around? Or are people just more generous during this time? Um, I think we could have interesting discussion about that. Yeah, I think I agree with everything Aaron said. I think we got great feedback to move forward 
um, for this year. And again, I think the biggest thing is that we want to work with all of you. We want to give you and focus on what's important to the group as a whole. And we look forward to involvement from different people, again, on different things moving through the year. And a big shout out to Lori, who did so much over the last couple of years and kept this group moving. She did a great job. Um, can't say you're going to get that same kind of leadership unless Erin really steps up, but we're going to do our best. We're definitely going to be the team. Julie's going to guide us. Um, but for me, the biggest thing is to, you know, hopefully down the road when we have our, maybe our set, second after hours, maybe our first, we can be in person, some of us, and just really be able to build up that camaraderie and, you know, have some time together. So Julie, now what are we going to just do open or touch on these other kind of hanging questions we had? I think like we could just officially close the meeting and um, 10.29. And um, I think we've had a really great conversation. Everyone's welcome to stay on. If you have other, you know, just anything you want to throw out there. I know we kind of facilitated, structured this like feedback loop, but please throw out if you have anything you'd like to share or question or ask to the group. Or if you need to jump off, totally understand that too. So I just wanted to mention quickly before I have to jump off that anybody who does anything with hunger can get free meals from us. You just have to connect with me because we pack them all the time and they always fly out. There's almost like waiting lists to get them. But if you directly hand out food to people or want to just connect with End Hunger any uh, and we'll make it happen. You can message me or text me or whatever. Ask Julie and she'll hook you up with me. But I want to make sure that all the South Shore nonprofits that feed people know that they can get free food from us. We just have to get it funded and volunteers to pack it and it's all yours. Awesome. Thanks, Matthew. And like I said, I'll be sending everyone the um, information. I'm going to stop the recording.